Force District Councils. Um, obviously, we are sister councils. Um, and today I will be talking to you about waste recycling, what happens to your waste, and we'll also touch a bit on sort of current and upcoming legislations and also how COVID has impacted the waste industry. So whenever we're talking about waste, this is a good place to start. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it, um, with being environmentally minded, uh, but this is the waste hierarchy. Um, and it's part of the European Waste Directive that came back out back in 2008. And it just ranks methods of waste disposal from least favored to most favored. So obviously at the bottom there, you've got disposal, uh, that's landfill. Very few local authorities across the country use landfill now. Um, that's down to the landfill tax. It came in in 1996 and was basically puts a price on per ton on waste sent to landfill. So back in 96, that was seven pounds a ton um, and it's gone up annually. So it currently it sits at 94 pounds and 15 pence per ton. So it's completely economically unviable um, for um, local authorities to send waste to landfill. And obviously, as well as having the environmental um, negative uh, implications. So if we then move up a step, you've got energy recovery. That is disposing of waste, usually refuse, um, in a way that we can get energy from it. So obviously the most common uh, way to do that is incineration. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then a step above, you've got recycling. Recycling is the act of breaking down a waste product into a sort of aggregate form um, and remaking it into a new product. Um, we've all heard of recycling, obviously, and that's why I'm here. Um, but it is quite interesting to note that recycling is only the third step on the waste hierarchy. And we do talk about it an awful lot. And then obviously above that, you've got reuse. Pretty self-explanatory. It's uh, reusing a product either for its intended purpose or something new. Um, minimization, which is, again, reduce. Um, that is reducing the amount of um, waste that you produce. And then finally, prevention, which is just not, not making it in the first place. Um, particularly, I'm sure many of you have heard of the zero waste lifestyle. You can get a lot of zero waste products now. And there are sort of um, refill stations and things popping up to, uh, to follow that zero waste lifestyle. And um, there are quite a few people now, actually, who follow that. And it can basically fit sort of a year's worth of rubbish in a jam jar. So it is becoming a lot more popular. Right. So thinking about legislation and targets that we're currently working towards, the biggest one is the um, EU target that 50% of UK waste uh, will be recycled by December 2020. Um, we were, at the time of making this PowerPoint, at about 46 to 47%. So probably not going to make that target, unfortunately. Um, furthermore, obviously with Brexit, it's very unclear whether the UK will continue to work towards these EU targets that have been sent out, uh, set out. Central government hasn't fed anything back to local authorities. So we don't really know what we're working towards either. Um, so there's yeah a lot of questions about, about that target at the moment. Um, we also have the Waste and Resources Strategy that came out in 2018, and that sets out five targets that we are striving towards. And they are that all plastic packaging is to be reusable, recyclable or compostable by 2025. To eliminate all food waste sent to landfill by 2030. To elim eliminate unnecessary plastic waste by 2030. And to double resource productivity and eliminate all avoidable waste by 2050. And as part of this waste and resources strategy, um, there's been a few sort of uh, other legislations that are coming in to help us meet the targets. Um, the first one is the deposit return scheme, which is the, the scheme that basically lets consumers um, take plastic bottles and drinks cans back to either the retailer or to reverse vending machines um, and get about a 10p deposit back. So obviously the cost will go up of the product um, and then we will get a 10p 
back to either spend at that same reta retailer or supermarkets in as a voucher um yes yeah, so we that is supposed to be sort of coming in again i'll touch on that a little bit later when we talk about covid um you've also got extended producer responsibility which is a huge movement um which is basically to point the finger back at the the producers so it's putting all the responsibility on them to be creating more uh, recyclable environmentally friendly reusable packaging um, and that part of that we have the the plastic packaging tax which is putting a levy on the um plastics sorry packaging that have got less than 30 percent non-version plastics um, and that's going to be at about 200 pounds per ton um, so basically the manufacturers are going to have to start taking responsibility for what they're doing and use uh, more environmentally friendly methods of packaging their goods. All right. And where do South Oxfordshire sit in terms of all of these and uh, all these targets and recycling as a whole? So we are very good. We have got currently a 63.3% recycling rate. And um, that is the second best in the country. And Vale of Whitehorse uh, sits at fourth at 62.5%. Um, the annual rates are about to come out, so keep your eyes peeled for that because um, we're, we're hoping that we can knock East Riding of Yorkshire off the top spot again, uh, like we used to be. Um, but yeah, we are great at recycling. That orange line there is Vale, the blue line is South Oxfordshire. So you can see that back into sort of 2009, there was a huge spike in recycling rate. Um, that was when the new contract with Biffa came in. And whenever a new contract comes in, there tends to be a rise in recycling um, just because you get new bins and, you know, the whole, we, we do put so many communications out there about the new, the new service. Um, this contract is up for renewal in a few years. So hopefully we will go up again. But you can see that the general trend there is that it is declining slightly. Um, However, the way that they calculate the recycling rate is based on tonnage, which means that actually if the total amount of waste produced decreases, the recycling rate will also decrease. So that might not necessarily be an awful thing because it means that our residents are producing less. We really strive to make recycling as easy as possible. We have fantastic residents. We, we don't attribute this high recycling rate to ourselves. We know that it's you. Um, everyone we've got so many sort of community action groups like yourselves um who focus on on the environment uh, we collect garden waste we ha we're quite rural so we do get that tonnage from garden waste compared to a city who's obviously got a lot of flats where they they have more problems with recycling um but we also have councillors that are very sort of green minded without being green um which definitely helps um, and to make it as easy as possible we collect the five sort of main recycling groups we categorize our plastics recycling by item not uh, the type of plastic um, and we try and do as many comms as possible um, however we do still have some problems uh, with people not putting the right things in their bins so hopefully none of you will recognize this this is our oops tag that we put on bins and um, if they are containing something that's not recyclable you've got options there that our crews can tick they will not collect the bin and they will put that tag on it it is then the responsibility of the resident to remove the non-recyclable item or re remove the the waste if it's got food waste in it for example um, and either um, take that to the tip or they have to um, put it into their refuse bin and we will not return to empty that bin and in terms of the waste and resource strategy on the previous slide, uh, we don't send any of our food waste to landfill. We send a very small, small percentage um, to landfill, barely there. So why do we recycle? Obviously, the, the main one is to save the natural world and oceans. Um, so obviously, um, using landfill as a method of waste disposal, you have issues with chemical leaching into groundwater and soil, um, which is obviously the environmental um, impacts of that. Um, and if you look at media, you see a lot of photographs of sort of mammals choked up in plastics. Um, and it's estimated that 1 million birds and over 10,000 sea mammals die yearly from eating or being tangled in plastic waste in our oceans. 
Um, and the sad truth is that if waste isn't disposed of correctly, it will end up in the oceans. Um, there is actually a big patch of rubbish called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, in the Pacific Ocean, which is three times the size of France, a current a 1.6 million square kilometers. Um, they did believe that this was microplastics, which are those plastics that are smaller than five mil that tend to come out of our clothes and get through the filters on uh, washing machines. But they actually did a study quite recently where they sailed through it and took samples and they found that it's not just the microplastics, it's the, the sort of the larger pieces of plastic, the plastic bottles and big things they, that's ending up there as well. It's not just those tiny ones. Um, it's also estimated that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Of course, we also want to save humans. So there are adverse health effects um, associated with plastics now, uh, particularly for reuse. If you're reusing your standard plastic Coke bottle, for example, that will, um, they, especially if it's left in light, it can break down and there can be chemicals released into that. Um, if we go back to thinking about the sea, if you are a fish eater, particularly if you eat bottom feeder fish, it's estimated that you eat a credit card, credit card sized piece of plastic every week. And then finally, um, save resources and energy. It takes 10 litres of water to make a one litre plastic bottle from virg um, virgin plastics, so non-recycled. Um, and obviously aluminium and steel drinks and uh, food tins and cans, that has to, um, if they're, again, if they're virgin, they're not recycled, then there has to be a mining element in that as well. There's a lot of water displacement, that kind of thing. So yeah, a lot of reasons to recycle, but it's not all doom and gloom. Many of you will remember um, David Attenborough's episode of the Blue Planet, where he showed the effects of plastics on our oceans. And following the airing of that episode, there was a 50% reduction in the use of single use plastics. Um, unfortunately, after the 12 month period, it did start to go climb back up again. But it just shows that with the right person portraying the message and the right way of displaying it, like it really, we, we, you can um, bring about behavioral change. All right, so we'll quickly go through what you can put into your bins. Um, recycling is very easy. In our districts, like I say, we categorize plastics by item type and not the type of plastic. Um, so there's only sort of four main plastic items that you can put into your recycling bin and everything else should not be in there. So they are plastic pots, tubs, trays and bottles. So yogurt pots, ice cream tubs, sweet tubs, um, fruit and meat trays, insert trays from sort of chocolate boxes or anything sort of, it's in a cardboard box that's got one of those pull out plastic trays, um, drinks bottles, milk bottles, shampoo bottles, cleaning product bottles, they can all go in there. Tins and cans, aluminium and steel. Um, aerosol cans, as long as they're empty and depressurized. Glass jars and bottles. Paper and cardboard, as long as it's clean. Uh, so no grease stained pizza boxes. Um, tin foil and uh, Tetra packs, so food cartons, food and drink cartons. There is a photograph of everything that you can um, put in there. You don't have to remove lids and labels, they can stay on. And um, in fact, we encourage you to leave uh, the lids on plastic bottles because we like you to squash. If you can crush the air out of plastic bottles and then put the lids back on, um, it obviously saves you space in your bin. And because we collect mixed recycling, um, it helps to keep smashed glass out of those uh, plastic bottles. So actually separate those waste streams a little bit better. All right. Um, obviously there are quite a few symbols out there now on uh, plastic items particularly, uh, not just plastic actually, potentially recyclable items. But there are actually only two that mean that it's recyclable. So the one on the left you're probably all familiar with, it's called the Mobius Loop. It's the universal sign for recycling, the three arrows symbolizing the closed loop economy. Um, but you will see more and more of the one on the right now, uh, just to get it, make, try and make it a little bit clearer for everyone and sort of start again. They have brought out these ones um, that will just say recycle, don't recycle, check local recycling uh, for the different elements of um, an item that you're disposing of. So they're the only ones that you, you want, want, basically that mean yes. Then you've got this one that is really sneaky because it's green um, and it uses curved arrows, which I think they probably did on purpose. 
Um, it does not mean that an item is recyclable. It means that the producer made a financial contribution to recycling. Um, one of the places that I've really noticed it are on crisp tubes. So the, the Christmassy ones where you get like twiglets and stuff and the slightly fatter ones, um, they will have that on. So keep your eye on that. This one as well is another sneaky one. Um, the X would be a number, and that's just to tell you what percentage of the item is made from recycled materials, but doesn't necessarily mean that it is recyclable. And then finally, these two are um, to do with obviously paper and cardboard to show that they are um, from sustainable forests. Uh, so for every tree that they cut down, they'll plant a new one. So, and ignore the numbers. They mean absolutely nothing to us uh, in terms of recyclability. Tells you the type of plastic. Like I say, we do it on item type, so it's got it has no bearing on whether it's recyclable or not. All right, and then your black bin is basically everything else. So filmy plastics, particularly. Um, so yeah, crisp packets and biscuit wrappers, cling film, bubble wrap, the film off the top of trays, uh, like fruit and meat trays, that all has to go in there. Um, polystyrene. Um, we don't see a lot of polystyrene around anymore. I think they, they, uh, a lot of uh, sort of online shopping companies and stuff have realised that it is awful. Um, if it ends up in nature, they approximate it will take about 700 years to biodegrade, but they don't know, obviously, because it hasn't been around for that long. Um, and obviously, if you burn it, it can let off some pretty noxious fumes. Um, flower pots are not recyclable. And then hard plastics, so children's toy, toys, um, anything that doesn't have any flex in it, that won't be recyclable. Tissues and kitchen roll. Uh, unfortunately, the fibres in them are very short, which means that they can't be recycled. The same for tissue paper as well, they've got like wrapping tissue paper. Um, disposable coffee cups. Uh, I think that's probably a given for many of you, you'll know that. Um, although they look cardboard, they have, they're effectively laminated. Um, Similarly to uh, Pringles tubes, um, they'll have they have sort of another layer in there to, to keep them either airtight or dry. Um, food stayed items, like I say, greasy pizza boxes, any anything that's got food on it that you can't get off. So um, even if you've got like a tin foil tray that's got cheese on it because you've had it in the oven, that has to go into this bin as well. And blister packs of pills, and then finally, obviously, crisp tubes. And there's some picture there. And then obviously your food waste caddy, pretty easy. All food, including tea bags, eggshells and bones, coffee grounds, anything off your, off your plate or out of your fridge. Um, cooking oil that you can either pour in uh, freehand if you've got food in there, like bread and stuff particularly because it will soak it up, or you can put that in a one litre plastic bottle um, inside your food bin outside. Um, oil is brilliant for the processing end of things because it's got a really high calorific value. So um, definitely use your oil. And we do not accept any compostable or biodegradable packaging. So no vegware. Um, that's yeah, no vegware coffee cups or any other brand um, that we unfortunately that does not break down in our process that we use. Um, it, our process is quite quick. For getting rid of the food waste and it will not break down and so it is classed as contamination so your food waste bin will not be collected if you've got anything in there with the exception of bags because you can use any liner it doesn't have to be compostable and biodegradable you can use any plastic um, bag uh, a carrier bag a bread bag salad bag anything any kind of plastic bag that you've got in your kitchen already um, but you don't need to buy specific um, liners for it or compostable liners at that. You can use sort of pedal liners as well. And then obviously you've got a nice picture of food waste there. All right, so what happens to the waste? Your food waste is taken to a facility in Wallingford. It's an anaerobic digestion facility. It looks like this. Um, and when it gets there, the plastic bags are removed. It goes through a macerator and when, as it sort of spins round, um, the plastic is so, so much lighter that it lifts up and gets sucked out by air. And then that plastic bag is sent to, um, those plastic bags are sent to the same place that the black bin waste goes to, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, the food is, in, like I say, it's macerated and it's mixed with water to make what they call a food waste soup. that looks like this, it's lovely. Um, it's then pasteurized 
and pumped into one of these big five tanks. Those tanks are heated up to 37 degrees Celsius, which is obviously body temperature, and they are stirred for approximately 85 days. Um, this process is entirely anaerobic, which means there is no um, additional oxygen put in there, which is why those compostable and biodegradable products don't break down because they need oxygen to break down. Um, it being an anaerobic process means that we can accept um, all food types, including the meats and the bones and stuff like that, because obviously it's enclosed, so there's no risk of biohazard effectively. Um, so at the end of that process, uh, sorry, as it breaks down um, at the body temperature, effectively in these giant stomachs, uh, it releases methane, which is captured and converted into electricity to power approximately 4,800 homes. Um, and then at the end of the 85 days, we're left with a really, really nutrient rich digestate fertilizer that is sell sold on to local farmers. So food waste is great because everything that you put in that bin becomes two things. Uh, so it, it doesn't get enough sort of positive, a lot of people are put off by it because they think it's gross, but it's, it's fantastic. Um, this was a slide I added, la added in at last minute. So apologies that it's all on that, but um, garden waste as well. Some of you will have garden waste bins. Um, that is composted in a much more conventional manner at the same facility um, in big compost heaps called open windrows. Um, it, they, the compost is also sold to local farmers as well as um, being given away as part of our annual compost giveaway, which obviously hasn't happened this year because of COVID. Um, but for the same reason, we cannot accept compostable packaging. It's obviously that outside that it presents a litter issue if it gets blown away. Um, in addition to that, there is no way for our crews to know if an item thrown into a garden waste bin is compostable or not. Um, and it, there'll be, there's no filter process effectively. It gets put straight onto a compost heap. There's no one there to remove that. So we just can't accept anything in those bins either. So garden waste only, please. General waste. So your black bin contents are taken to an energy recovery facility up in Ardley. It looks like that. You can see it from the road if you're driving north. Um, and the waste is incinerated there, um, which generates currently power for approximately 60,000 homes across Oxfordshire. And that number is always increasing as homes become more energy efficient. By doing this, um, we have diverted 95% of our waste from landfill. Um, and I always get a lot of questions or worried looks when I mention incineration in these talks. Um, yes, obviously there is um, an output from this, but the emissions, so that the facility has to feed back all of their um, emissions values. So all of the, um, yeah, well, the emissions values back to the environment agency almost hourly. Um, the environment agency has an upper limit to, to those levels, basically. Um, and if they go over that limit, they are hit with a really, really high fine. Um, so they keep that well below that, um, well below that level using multitudes of um, different technologies for scrubbing those emissions. Um, Ardley do have a visitor center. If you go onto their website, it's Virador Ardley. Um, they'll be able to explain that in a little bit more technical detail, but is, is slightly above me, I'm afraid. Um, and at the end of the burning process, any metal that's left is recycled and the ash is taken away and used in construction, particularly road construction. All right, and then your recycling is loaded up onto the back of the truck, driven down to Cullum, um, where we have our transfer station and tipped out. At Cullum, uh, we have a very, very small team of people that will go through it very roughly and pull out anything that's obviously um, shouldn't be there. For example, black bags that they can see, um, textiles, nappies, food waste, that kind of stuff. Obviously it's impossible for them to go through it thoroughly, um, particularly as it's in a big pile and they can't get to that big pile and the trucks are coming in constantly on collection days. Um, so they just don't have that time. It is then loaded onto HGVs and driven down to Edmonton uh, where our material recovery facility is. Um, You've got a picture there of it being tipped out a column. When it gets to Edmonton, um, it's loaded onto a conveyor belt and there are a, another team of actual pickers. 
um, and they will remove anything that shouldn't be there. I should just say, I've missed a step, sorry. When it does get down to Edmonton, it gets tipped out and the facility will scan it meter by meter for contamination. If that contamination rate is too high, that is when it is rejected. So somebody asked a question um, beforehand uh, about, is it true that a, a truckload of recycling can get rejected for one person putting the wrong thing in? No, in short, one person putting one wrong thing in, depending what it is, probably won't get the whole truck rejected. However, if one person really doesn't recycle properly and puts a lot of food waste in their bin and our crews somehow miss it, um, that food waste can contaminate a uh, one of our bin trucks completely. Um, and then if that for some reason gets uh, picked up and taken to Edmonton, they can reject it. So there definitely can be implications down the line and rejections do happen. And obviously these HGVs, if, if you think of that one of our bin trucks carries about 26 tons, I think, um, the HGVs probably take 12 to 15 loads of those, if I had to guess. Um, so that is an, an inordinate amount of recycling that is wasted. Anyway, once it's got through that, hopefully, that phase, it's put on the conveyor belt, the team of pickers take out anything that shouldn't be there. Um, that conveyor belt then vibrates and it shakes off all the paper and cardboard. It then passes underneath a magnet, which will remove the, the metals. It's then scanned with um, infrared scanners that pick up exactly where the plastics are. It goes over the edge um, and they're blasted off with shoots of air and then the glass is left. So that's how we separate all the different material types. Um, those different material types are then treated separately. So glass is sort of smashed up into an aggregate form. Re um, plastics are melted down, the dyes are removed and they're turned into pellets um, and papers sort of bailed, shredded and bailed up like this. And then that's obviously what's sold on to um, other companies to be remanufactured into brand new products. Sorry, I'm just gonna cough, excuse me. <coughs> Um, obviously we get a lot of questions about end destination data. Where does your recycling go? Um, this is the most recently public available publicly available data. We have to feed back all of um, this sort of information to DEFRA annually and then DEFRA have to check it. So there's always a little bit of a lag in getting that, that information. Um, so like I say, 2018-19 is the most recent one. I imagine that the new ones will be coming out at the same time as our recycling rates, if I'm correct. Um, in short, yes, our recycling does go overseas. <coughs> the UK does not have um, the infrastructure, the recycling infrastructure to make recycled products. We just don't, it's not a, an industry that we have here. Um, however, it's important to note that recycling is, an, a, a, is a commodity. There is an economic benefit to recycling. The county council get money for our recycling. You know, that helps fund our public services. To dump recycling in a, a field in Malaysia is to dump money. Um, so as far as we are aware, and BIFA are aware, BIFA also own the material that the, MR, uh, the MRF where our recycling goes, we are following the rules completely, okay? Um, so this table shows the, the destinations for 2018, 19. You can see that they're all in the UK and Europe. However, it is worth noting that some of those companies will be brokers, so they will sell it on. Um, all of this kind of information, by the way, is publicly available. You can find it on Waste Data Flow. It's quite a tricky um, website to use. If you'd like instructions on how to use it, feel free to send me an email and I will send them over to you because we do have some. Um, <clears throat> there's a quite a lot of negativity about people thinking about China. Um, however, all of our recycled plastics come from China, pretty much. Um, so anything that you own that's plastic and recycled probably came from China and China have actually got incredibly high standards um, for the plastic that they will accept for recycling. Um, we had to, one of the reasons we had to stop, um, I believe, recycling plastic bags is because uh, that's where we used to send it and the quality of plastic bags are so low that they, they just didn't want them anymore because it was too poor quality, basically. Um, but yes, so we do... We, as far as we're aware, we're doing everything correctly as our BIFA, 
but obviously we can't account for external third parties that are overseas. Recycling barriers. What are the main barriers for recycling to be more successful? That was one of the questions that I got asked. Um, we obviously do still have a lot of barriers. Um, the main one being contamination, uh, which is putting the wrong thing in the bin. <clears throat> You've got the four big contaminants, nappies, textiles, food waste, and black bin liners. Um, black bin liners are an issue because our crews need to be able to see into the bags, obviously, to make sure that there is recycling, which is why recycling should always be loose or in a clear sack. Um, we do find that a lot of the time black bins uh, black bin bags end up in our transfer station. They do contain food waste or nappies. Um, contaminants tend to be a, a, an item in your recycling bin that is going to change the quality of the recycling around it. So wet goods, so nappies and uh, food waste particularly. Um, when, if you think about the back of a bin truck, it gets compressed in order to fit all the bins in there. Um, and when it gets compressed, that food waste or wetness will spread. And as we collect mixed recycling, particularly the paper and cardboard will suffer. It will get soggy and it can take up to two months between your bin being collected from curbside to being um, processed down in London. So that will go moldy. Um, so it's a real issue, but it's not just an issue for us. It's a national issue. That's why we really, really sort of if you look at any of our leaflets, we always mention contamination now. A bit for it to do a lot of big pushes on contamination. We've got those oops tags and all that kind of thing. Um, um, textiles are, are unfortunately quite another big one. We get a lot of textiles in our bins as well. Um, we obviously do do uh, separate textiles collections. Um, you can recycle them by putting them in a bag next to your recycling bin. Um, and I think, I don't know whether people get their wires crossed there because they know that it can get recycled, but it's a completely different waste stream and it goes to charity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yeah, the issue really is um, that it has quite a lot of implications further down the line. And um, we talked about obviously the, the rejections at um, the MRF um, like to, it, yeah, sorry. It's a, um, it will have a huge negative impact to, lose all of that recycling and have it sent to be incinerated when it could otherwise be good quality. And you've got some pictures here of contamination, food waste contamination at Cullum, at our transfer station. You can just see, particularly in that first picture there, there's textiles as well. It's just, it really, really spreads and it's really not pleasant for the people that have to pick through that. Um, we also have a few issues with um, environmental movements and blanket approaches. Um, so, compostable and biodegradable packaging uh, ending up in our bins and bit or bins getting rejected because they've got that in there especially food waste bins obviously um, the national trust when they uh, started doing their magazine in a potato starch wrapper um, about a year ago and when they first did that it had a message on it that said put me in your food bin um, we got a lot of queries about that obviously um, which is infuriating because they're, they're, yes, they're doing something great because they're not using plastic. However, a lot of these big blanket approaches um, don't filter down to a local authority level. So always check with your local authority on anything that you've got, any questions you've got, please contact us because um, something that might seem massive and sort of apply nationally just doesn't, doesn't kind of come down to us and what we do. Every local authority does things differently, unfortunately. Um, so, please talk to us. And we do have bin zone as well, which is our app or web tool where you can search for an item and it will tell you which bin to go in to avoid contamination. And then my last slide, um, which is the impact of COVID-19 on waste. So we obviously talked about all of those legislations at the beginning there, um, extended producer responsibility, deposit return scheme and the plastic packaging tax have all been delayed. Um, so obviously Parliament suspended back in March and that's when a lot of these were going to be sort of decided. Um, so unfortunately none of them have come in but I do believe that they should be hopefully in the next few months coming in. Um, Scotland were sort of being the guinea pigs for us um, for the deposit return scheme. They were really going straight ahead with it um, and they've actually now postponed that by over a year. So that hasn't come in in Scotland. 
um, there was a big issue with import export of packaging of recycled packaging um, as many of the plastics were coming from China and obviously they're in a complete and total lockdown. Uh, many of you remember that there was an issue at the beginning with um, a shortage of hand sanitizer and that wasn't actually to do with the hand sanitizer it was to do with the bottles that it was in um, they were all stuck offshore because they were coming from China so because a lot of the hand sanitizer was made in Ireland unfortunately so could have got it it's just out of reach um, there's all, there was also issues with social distancing at our MRF uh, down in Edmonton um, you saw that photo of them all in the conveyor belt uh, obviously they had to social distance, they were doing shift work, which just meant that they couldn't take in the volume of recycling that we were producing because we had an increase in household waste um, and an increase in recycling because everybody was at home. Unfortunately, that also meant that there was a slight increase in contamination as well. So on this graph here, um, you'll see the um, first two are March last year and this year. The second two clusters are April last year against this year and then May. Um, so you can see it's a comparative that they've all gone up, particularly refuse. Um, so, yeah, we had this huge um, increase in tonnage um, that was putting strain on our crews as well, being able to collect it because they were having to make more tips um, going to offload more often. And then obviously we had um, an increase in staff illness in our crews as well. You can't social distance if you're a bin man. Uh, you're in a cab with one, two other men uh, or women. So um, we we really struggled with that. And Biffa were fantastic. We were one of the few local authorities in the country that didn't drop a waste stream. I mean, if you go over the border into Bucks, um, some of the districts in Bucks actually stopped collecting recycling altogether. So we managed to continue collecting all of our bins. And that was really down to Biffa managing to get through that. It was brilliant. All right, so I've got a few questions that were sent in that I'm just going to try and whiz through. I am aware of the time. 40 minutes on the dot, though. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. Um, <laughs> all right, so one of the questions I got were, who are the greatest consumers, big corporates, small businesses, etc., of recycled materials, and how is this changing? Um, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question. Um, as a local authority, we are specifically sort of a collections authority. Um, we don't know about corporate stuff. We only deal with household waste. Um, so, sorry, the basically. And in terms of how is this changing, obviously you mentioned about the extended producer responsibility. Um, so it's, it, it's not so much on the consumer. It's, it's just gonna be going back to the producer. Um, what is the impact on the environment of the recycling process? Similar question, is it energy efficient to recycle? Um, the imp environmental impact will be minimal compared to using virgin materials to manufacture anything in the first place, um, or obviously landfilling it. Um, if you think of the waste hierarchy, obviously it's higher than any sort of other way of disposing of waste. Um, the only sort of impact would be obviously the lack of processing um, infrastructure in the UK, as I mentioned, the fact that we can't actually manufacture them here. However, they are, there are talks, there have been talks that I've heard in sort of webinars throughout COVID that COVID actually presents an opportunity for the waste industry in the UK to completely restructure um, and reprioritize and think about moving those, like building these infrastructures um, so that we, if it happens again, we don't completely lose out on, uh, you know, shut down on those um, aspects of things. Um, however, waste, the waste industry does tend to get neglected by central government quite a lot. Um, so there needs to be more pressure put on central government to actually think about sort of waste as an essential service and how we can maintain that we always sort of have these things running and we don't run into any other problems if there is ever another pandemic. Um, do recycling centres work closely with uh, research and development organisations to change their own game? what innovations have taken place over the last few years and what's in the pipeline. Um, unfortunately, this question also would not be a question for me. It's, this is more to um, try and talk to a material recovery facility um, or a waste contractor such as Biffa. Um, so in terms of innovations, 
um, and research and development. They're obviously constantly trying to working to make it as cost, cost effective as possible. Like I said, it's got an economic value, um, um, but it's difficult to make a big change um, because all recycling waste, although it tends to get neglected, it is tied to legislation from central government, DEFRA and the Environment Agency. Um, so there's nothing ma major that sort of happened. Um, the only thing would be maybe it's not really recent, but obviously being able to recycle products like Tetra packs, that was kind of due to growing pressure. They never used to be able to be recycled. Um, there has to be an end market for something to, for a big innovation like that to happen. But we also have to have the technology. Um, so there's not really been um, a huge thing for that. Uh, is there an Im image issue with recycled products? Now, I think that this question, um, I think what it means is, the aesthetic sort of um, the aesthetics of a product where in terms of consumers so if that's wrong feel free to put it in the comment box is that not what you meant um, but yeah basically recycled materials do tend to be a little bit less aesthetically pleasing than their virgin counterpart um, plastics will be cloudy for example um, so a lot of producers might like, that's probably why they've been so stubborn to move to recycled materials for so long. Um, but the same also, I think as a producer, I think we probably, no matter how environmentally minded you are at some, sometimes you've probably got a little bit of vanity in what you're buying and what you're using. Um, so it does need to be a huge behavioral shift in the consumer really for, for producers to, to, um, not have image concerns as well but then a lot of producers are doing changing on their own um i think i can't remember which bottle it is i think it was um lilt or the other one the other green bottle i think changed their design to to be able to use recycled plastic so that it's not green anymore um so they could use clear ones which is made from recycled um and also things like um there's been obviously a behavioral shift towards pringles because i don't know if you guys have heard that pringles are redesigning their iconic tube to make it recyclable which is great. Um, would SADC support post hung recycling bins, which could be on the same post as a general waste bin? This is what we call on the go recycling. We do have some, um, a few in some of our market towns across both districts. Unfortunately, on the go recycling doesn't really work. People abuse them. Uh, contamination is incredibly high. Uh, usually higher than recycle, like the amount of recyclables in there. You um, coffee cups particularly end up in there, and I mean, even if you have a single stream bin, so rather than have a mixed recycling bin, have a um, a plastic bottle bin. People will still abuse it. Um, Oxford City put in coffee cup bins um, for recycling coffee cups, and they had to take them away at the beginning of lockdown because they were being abused so much and they'd only been there for a few months so they they although they're a great idea and it's lovely and it works in theory um it's better just to take your recycling home really um, that's what we kind of push for because at least we know that you're going to do the right thing it's the other people unfortunately um the waste hierarchy is to reduce reuse and lastly recycle do you have any numbers on whether waste and recycled materials are reducing overall over time is there any evidence that people are reducing and reusing I do not have any numbers. However, I think it is quite evident that people are reducing and reusing. Um, obviously, again, this huge sort of, um, well, a behavioral shift towards the zero waste lifestyle. The fact that you are seeing all these little independent shops, um, sort of, you know, the zero waste shops popping up. The fact that the big supermarkets like Waitrose and I believe Asda now are doing refill stations um, to reduce the amount of waste there, um, as well as food waste. Um, and packaging waste um, and I would to be honest I think that recycling is only going to increase particularly with extended producer responsibility the plastic packaging tax I think we will see a, an increase in recycling tonnages and percentages which is great as long as we see a decrease in refuse um, so yeah Okay, so now I think if I stop this, I'll be able to see the comments box. Uh, stop share. Here we go. So just bear with me one second. All right. My oh, goodness, there's lots. Um, can plastic bags be included? 
I believe that probably relates to um, uh, are they recyclable? Plastic bags are a awkward one. Sorry? Can they go in the green bin? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Don't worry. Um, they they can go in the green bin. This is a, a topic that makes me slightly sweat and a bit nervous. Um, so plastic bags are what we call non-target, um, which means they were once recycled. Um, unfortunately, there was the end market disappeared, and that's what I was mentioning about China. Um, so rather than change the messaging and say that they cannot go in a bin, um, it's easier to, to not confuse residents, uh, etc., in the hope that that market is going to come back because it only went away quite recently. Um, we do still accept them in recycling bins because they are easy to remove. They're not contaminants because they don't affect the quality of the recycling around you. They're very easy to pull out at the MRF. Um, however, I would encourage you to use a plastic bag to line your food bin instead or take it to a plastic bag collection point at your local supermarket because they, I'm not sure where they go, but I assume that they actually recycle them because that's all they take. Um, some compostable packaging states that it can also be recycled. Is this true? No. If something is compostable, it is not recyclable. It will be made from something that's got very, very short fibers, um, or it will be made from potato starch or anything like that. Um, if, if it can be recycled, it's not in your bin, your green bin. It, they might have, I would contact maybe the manufacturer to check if what they mean by that. But um, in terms of our local authorities and our districts, they can't be recycled. Uh, like I said, short fibers like tissues can't be made into new paper or anything like that. Do you manage to sell all of the output from the garden waste and food waste process to the local farmers? Um, I believe so. That would be down to seven Trent Green Power um, who own the facility. We don't deal with any of that. Um, when we, but um, I don't think they've ever had a surplus, to be honest. I'm sure they've probably got a queue of people wanting it. Um, when we visited the site, they told us that if the emissions exceeded very strict limits, the whole plant automatically shut down. Huge incentive. Absolutely. Um, they do they do an annual shutdown, I think, anyway, just to sort of make sure, give it a rest, I guess. Um, and it costs them so much money to stop it and start it. Uh, like it tear bring tear jerking amounts of money um, which is why they tend to only light it once a year and let's let it run um, should we wash pots before putting in the bin I always feel like that's wasting water yes you should wash pots before you put them in the bin please and um, I mean depending on the pot uh, particularly if it's a yogurt pot for example yes please if it's a uh, for example a pot that's maybe had herbs in it um, from one of those meal prep kits that's what i the other pots that i use um no if that's just a bit dusty it's more that if it's got something that's going to go moldy so yogurt or um liquid but you don't need to i mean if you're going to be doing your washing up you feel free to just rinse it in the same water you don't have to scrub it under the tap it's just to get that residue off it doesn't need to be sort of sparkling clean like your dishes um where do the bags of road sweepings and town rubbish bin contents go so the um, streets teams that they go to the same place so they go to Ardley as refuse um, leaf fall I believe goes to the same place that garden waste goes to um, but obviously there's issues with contamination in that I, I think so but I may be wrong on that one but yes yeah, streets streets are still part of Biffa we still have the streets contract as well um, so that will go to Ardley um, what should we do with vegware put it in your black bin I'm afraid, or put it on your home compost heap if you have one. Otherwise, it has to go into the black bin. There's no other, other bin it can go into. And that's the compostable and biodegradable packaging, if any of you weren't aware what vegware is. Why is it okay to use normal plastic bags in the food caddies? Because they're all removed um, and they, they're removed anyway. So the compost, whether they're compostable or plastic, they're both removed and they're sent to the same place. They're sent to be incinerated. So you might as well, I mean, 
depending on where your priorities lie, you might want to save yourself the money from buying compost, a roll of compostable liners um, and use what you've either got lying around the house or buy pedal liners if they're cheaper. Um, or don't, you don't have to line them at all. You can just put food in straight away. Um, you can, some people put a little bit of newspaper in it just to absorb some of the liquid that will come off the food. Um, and then you can just tip it straight in. You don't have to use a bag if you don't want to. Um, and actually, if you are using bags, the facility do prefer plastic bags because they, the thing with compostable and biodegradable bags is they break down. So they can start to split and go smushy, um, which makes them they, much harder to come out, uh, to get pulled out of that process that I told you about when they lift because of the air, they're heavy and smushy and starting to break down. Um, so either loose or in a plastic bag really. Uh, won't they be putting plastic into the fertilizer they produce and putting on the food crops? Um, theoretically not because it should all come out and that process, but uh, seven Trent Green Power uh, Facility are well, were well ahead of their time. So they put in uh, sort of microplastic filters years ago, really, really, really fine filters to, to remove all plastics beforehand in the pasteurization process. Um, so uh, that no, there shouldn't be. And if there is, it will be minimal. Uh, I understood that bags that come with veg fruit, etc., if they are stretchy and recycle, they recycled, but if not, not if they crackle, sorry. So that is how uh, Oxford City determine their filmy plastics. I don't have any around me. Um, we, there is a test called the scrunch test. I don't like it. <laughs> um, personally uh filmy plastics because there's so many unknowns around them um i tend to put them in my refuse bin um also because like i say the they're very light so they have a very low economic value in terms of recycling um and you need an awful lot of them to to recycle um, but we do the scrunch test which is if you screw up the filmy plastic in your hand and let go if it springs back out to its original shape like a crisp packet would it is not recyclable if you screw it up and it holds its shape then it is um but that's i um, yes yeah, so technically if you do that you and it's recyclable you can put it in your green bin but i i am dubious of that um can shredded paper go in the green bin yes it can um, you can go in, loose into your bin or it can go next to your bin in a cardboard box or clear bag because we do take um, extra waste as well. Probably best to put it in a clear bag just so it doesn't blow away if the bin gets knocked over or anything. Why is a plastic coated carton recyclable but not a pizza box with a bit of grease? Um, a pizza box with a bit of grease is not recyclable because that counts as contamination because it is food waste. That, that grease uh, will go mouldy. And that, like I talked about, obviously will spread through your recycling. Um, whereas a plastic coated carton, we have the technologies to remove that plastic and remove the foil and keep the paper separate and recycle them all separately. Um, brilliant talk, Jessica. Thank you. And thanks for the Binzone app. Is buying a Tetra Pak carton any better than normal plastic bottles? No. Um, plastic bottles are more likely to be recycled now as well as recyclable um, so single use is single use to be honest um, and you know there's a lot of people you can now see that you can get sort of water in cans instead of plastic bottles and everyone's thinking great because it's less plastic bottles single use is single use plastic gets demonized a lot um, but it's much of a muchness if you're buying something single use it's better just to get reusable and um, to be honest so no in short um aside from since covid is waste and recycling overall going up or down over time are we reducing our waste over time yes we are reducing our waste um looking at the general trend uh, the, the total amount of waste tonnage is what was decreasing um, like I say, the rates for 2019, 20, no, 2019-20, yeah, will be out. No, wait, that can't be right. Sorry, because it runs it. Anyway, there's going to be rates out very soon. The DEFRA rates for all of the um, all of the local authorities around the country are producing uh, coming out very soon. So that will be all of the tonnages. So you can do a nice comparison as well if you look on waste data flow. Sorry about that, slight brain fart moment. Um, 
Can you recycle in a packaging of, say, biscuits? If not, what happens if this is put in the recycling? If not, what happens if this is put in the recycling? Um, the inner packaging of biscuits, um, it depends. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So you obviously, I'm thinking of a biscuit packet. You can sometimes they'll be in a plastic tray, um, sort of slotted like that. They would be recyclable. That is a plastic tray, so that would count um, as a recyclable item. If it's a big bot, like a tin of biscuits, it would also be in a plastic tray. That is recyclable. Um, oh, you've unmuted yourself, have you? Yeah. Are you gonna? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the biscuits. I, I get these boxes of oat cake type biscuits. That inside the box, there's little plastic packages of. <laughs> oh, I'd like the foil, like a plasticky. Like a filmy plastic, clear plastic, yeah, yeah. So um, I would they would they are not recyclable. All oh, right. Um, so sorry, I hope we've all, don't don't worry, everyone. Everyone has that moment in these talks and goes, oh god. Um, I would put, um, yeah, they're not recyclable. If it ends up in your recycling, it will be removed at the material recovery facility if it gets that far. If you had a whole load of them in your green bin and our crew saw them, they wouldn't they wouldn't collect your bin. Um, so put them in your black bin. Now you know. <laughs> um, dirty plastic is a barrier to being it being recycled. Dirty plastic is a barrier to it being recycled. Is it not eco-friendly to wash it and to enable it to be recycled? Um, dirty plastic is a barrier to it being recycled. Is it not eco-friendly to wash it and enable it to be recycled? Yes. Yes, it is. That's, so that's what we want you to do is, is to always rinse your, your plastic um, that is got food waste on it. But when I was talking about the barriers to recycling food waste, that wasn't that's not food waste. It's sort of remnants of food on plastic items or tinfoil trays or of, like any of that kind of stuff. They are um, I, people putting bags of food in their bin. Uh, in their recycling bin, which we do get quite a lot as well. So they will, instead of using the food bin, they'll use their recycling bin. So um, yes, it would be eco-friendly to wash it. Please, uh, would your, will your talk be posted for future viewing? I believe this is being recorded. Um, Jeanette will confirm where this is going, I'm sure. If companies like TerraCycle can process hard to recycle items and make new products from in the UK, why is it possible? To, is, why isn't it possible that they to recycle their own plastics, etc. here? TerraCycle um, works with manufacturers. It's part of extended producer responsibility. They work with the producers themselves. The producers put in a lot of money to make these new technologies to recycle these difficult items. TerraCycle's positive impact is questionable, depending on the item. Uh, crisp packet recycling scheme that I think you guys have in Watlington. I think you have a collection point. Yeah, uh, we did as well. And we stopped it uh, because it was a trial. And the, when I did a little bit of digging into that scheme, it was something like 0.001% of the crisp packets that were being generated by walkers were being recycled. And obviously we and whoever, um, I think you, yeah, whoever has to go through those crisp packets has to go through those crisp packets. And we were finding things like jam sandwiches in those crisp packets and stuff like that. So we, um, yes, it's TerraCycle. Although it's in theory is fantastic and it helps these manufacturers, it, they may maybe make a difference. It also helps these manufacturers look like they're green, it's greenwashing basically. Um, so it's, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're questionable. Some manufacturers as well do it on their, off their own backs and they don't use TerraCycle. Uh, Nespresso, the coffee pods, they have their own recycling scheme and a lot of manufacturers are just starting to do that themselves. Um, but like I say, it's, there, it's because they're getting such a large volume of this product because they're collecting them themselves and that's all that they're collecting, that they can then afford to get these technologies and recycle the products. Um, it would be a huge shift to make it a nationwide of every re recycling facility to get new infrastructure and new technologies and every local authority to change their messaging and their collections. Obviously, a lot of local authorities are on uh, source segregated collections where they have multiple bins for different waste streams. And that tends to be stick to the main recycling waste streams. Um, does SODC produce an A4 poster of what goes in each bin? It would be good to have a copy or print from your slides. Um, SODC have bin stickers 
that you should have in on all of your bins. Um, I can supply those if you would like to send me an email um, um, that I will, I'm um, sure Jeanette can pass round if uh, we want to. Um, uh, but yes, we have bin stickers. I've got leaflets. We do tend to, we have got a leaflet coming out this Christmas. So keep an eye on your post box for that. Okay. I think Thank I you, Jessica. Stop. Thank you. I was going to say, we could probably carry on all night. <laughs> Questions are still coming. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. I have to say that was such a fantastic talk. I learned so much about recycling was, and mm. waste in general. That was really amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, but if we do have any other questions, perhaps that don't get answered, um, perhaps it's all right if the people just send them directly to you. Is that a you good can, idea? Yeah, so I've just put our general waste team email address in the yep. chat box, which is probably better to use than mine because okay. it will get picked up a lot quicker. Um, yep. If you can't see it, it's waste.team at southandvale.gov.uk. Uh, um, so I, but it will be me that answers you anyway. So probably yep. best use that. Um, and what we're doing is um, we're going to be writing up an article on this that will go in the Watlington Times. Um, so we'll cover the main points so that we can try and get the message out to every, you know, more people within the village. Because I think it was Jenny that made the point that, yeah, not many people know about the plastic bags having changed, for instance, which I think is probably true. So we will try and I think we've got a good number of people on this call, but we're going to try and reach many more um, just by, you know, through your talk. Brilliant. That's fantastic. I would like to clarify with, with the plastic bags. Um, yeah, like that we do still accept them. Yep. Um, just, but maybe just encourage people to use them for their food bins instead. I just, yeah. I, I don't want to get into trouble. No, no, no. It. So yeah, we'll try and cover a few key points maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. Um, we're going to be running some more events over the next few months. Um, we're just sorting out a speaker in talking about offshore wind that'll probably be our next talk in January um, we'll publish any events in the Watlington Times through our website and our social media um, and you can also sign up for the Watlington Climate Action Group monthly newsletter um, so that's that's it really thank you very much everybody for attending um, and we'll say goodbye yes, thanks thank you very, very much. much for coming everybody mm -hmm. right, thank you Bye. Thank you. Thank Good you very now. much. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.